Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today we will be discussing the sinking of MS Achille Laro, a cruise ship that caught fire and sank in the Indian Ocean. Before we dive in, I must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, hijacking, terrorism, murder, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before I begin that I am not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. There will be some terms in Italian and Dutch, languages in which I am not fluent, but I will do my best to give accurate pronunciations. You'll recognize a name in this story if you've been around Shipwreck Sunday for a little while. If you recall the sinking of MTS Oceanos, there was a man by the name of Moss Hills, a musician and entertainer who pretty much was the rescue effort for MTS Oceanos. Ironically enough, he'd find himself aboard the Achille Laro, affectionately nicknamed the Blue Lady. Originally, MS Achille Laro was known as MS Willem Rise, named after the grandson of the founder of the company who ordered her, Rotterdamsche Lloyd a Dutch shipping company now known as Ned Lloyd, and that's what we'll refer to the company as going forward. She was ordered on May 7, 1938 to replace aging ships on the Dutch East Indies route for Ned Lloyd and being built by Koninklijke Machevich de Schelde Shipyard in Vlissingen, the Netherlands. Her keel would be laid January 25th, 1939, in yard number 214, but as many of us know, World War II would begin later that year, on September 1st, 1939, and this would delay the building of Willem Rise due to bombing raids. The ship was finally launched later on July 1st, 1946, and christened by Queen Wilhelmina. And if you're wondering why she was named after the founder's grandson, it's because the young man was captured by the enemy during World War II and shot. MS Willem Rise displaced 21,119 gross registered tons, displacing 23,629 gross registered tons after a later refurbishment. She was 642 feet in length, had an 82-foot beam, a 29.3-foot draft, and spanned nine decks, six of these being accessible to passengers. She could accommodate 869 passengers originally and 1,372 after the refurbishment, with a crew of 300. She was driven by two Sulzer Winterthur and six Sulzer de Schelde engines, powering two propellers. She averaged a service speed of 22 knots, which is just perfect for cruising. Her superstructure was quite unique for the era. She had low-hung aluminum lifeboats within the upper works flanks, with the next ship to follow this trend being the SS Canberra in 1961. It's actually a layout that all cruise ships follow to this day, using fiberglass reinforced plastic, or FRP, lifeboats instead of aluminum. As Achille Laro, she'd be painted a beautiful, rich blue with two blue smokestacks with black tips. Her call sign was originally PIQF and would change to IBHE later, with her IMO number being 5390008. The ship was registered first in Rotterdam, Netherlands, but would be registered in different places under different ownership. She was a gorgeous ship, and looked sleek and art deco like many ocean liners of the 1940s and 1950s. The ship was completed on November 21st, 1947, and her main voyage began on December 2nd, 1947, setting out from Rotterdam, Netherlands to Indonesia. With her running mate and top competitor, MS Orange of the Netherland Line, the Wilhelm Rise became an ever-popular ship on the Dutch East Indies route, until the East Indies gained their independence from the Netherlands in 1949. At that point, that route became far less popular, and her passenger numbers dropped. During that glimpse in time, however, future Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, traveled on the Willem Rise right after graduating in the United Kingdom. However, not all of her career was sparkles and sunshine. In 1953, on January 6th, Willem Rise was in the Red Sea with running mate MS Orange, and they were heading the opposite direction. 
In the 1950s, it was common for passenger liners to pass each other at close range in order to entertain the passengers on the boat decks. Arash approached very quickly and abruptly, which would later be heavily criticized. Willem Rise suddenly made an unexpected swing to the left, which resulted in a massive collision. Smash! Arash's bow smashed into Wilhelm Rise, which badly damaged the bow of the Arash. Luckily, Wilhelm Rise wasn't as badly damaged, and no one was killed. As for MS Orange, there was a big risk she would be impounded merely for safety reasons, and so she wasn't able to call at Colombo as she was scheduled to, so she went on directly to Jakarta. In the end, the fault laid with both ships for the severe lack of communication, a common theme we see here on Shipwreck Sunday. A journey aboard the Willem Rise is well documented in the book Journey to Java by author, English diplomat, and diarist Harold Nicholson when he wrote about his 1957 tour of the Far East with his wife, author and poet, Vita Sackville West. They traveled for two months consecutively, and the book provides a detailed account of their first-class travel and gives us a window into what it was like to be a first-class passenger aboard Wilhelm Rise in the 1950s. If you want to read that book, you can find used copies in multiple places, but I'll leave a link in the description for a copy I found on Amazon. Future listeners, be wary, this link may only be reputable for the time I release the episode. After being repaired for the accident with Orange, Royal Rotterdam Lloyd, or Ned Lloyd, which is what they are currently, released Wilhelm Rise to the open Atlantic for transatlantic passages, taking the northern Atlantic route. She was on the New York City route to begin with, later taking the Canadian route as well. In 1958, Ned Lloyd and their competitors, Netherland Line, owner of the Orange, signed an agreement to create a round-the-world passenger service. These kinds of services started getting more popular once transatlantic crossings were less popular out of immigration or necessity, and the cruise market began getting more popular. They are still pretty popular to this day, though they are pricey. The joint fleet, containing the ships MS Orange, the Johan van Oldenbarne Velt, that would be later known as TSMS Laconia, and Willem Rise, later known as the Achille Laro, would be run under the banner of, quote, the Royal Dutch Mail Ships. These three vessels underwent massive refits to prepare for the new service, with Wilhelm Rise making two charter trips for the Europa Canada service shortly afterward. From September 20th, 1958 until February 25th, 1959, she would get a facelift at the Wilton Fjornord shipyard in Amsterdam, the capital city of the Netherlands. This turned her from an ordinary passenger liner into a cruise ship with her original four-class system, first class, second class, third class, and third tourist class, turning into just the first and tourist classes that we commonly saw in the 1940s and 1950s. As part of her facelift, she would have air conditioning extended throughout all of the accommodations, as well as 100 new cabins, which is what raised her passenger capacity from 869, as we mentioned earlier, breaking down into 275 first class and 770 tourist class for a total of 1,045 as of then. Some of the cabins were interchangeable in case more of one class or the other was booked, and there was an extra berth fitted so she could have a maximum of 1,167 at this time. Her original Javanese crew members were replaced by a European crew, and they required upgraded crew accommodations, and so those were added as well. She was also fitted with a new glazing in the first class winter garden. Her forward funnel was heightened a little bit, and new stabilizers were fitted. Stabilizers are fins or rotors mounted beneath the waterline and emerging laterally from the hull to reduce a ship's roll due to wind or waves. They are especially important for modern day ships since the draft above the waterline is typically vastly higher than that of the height below the water, which can make a ship unstable. Because of the revamp, she now displaced 23,114 gross registered tons instead of 21,119 GRT. She was large, in charge, and beautiful. All shiny and new, Wellum Rise set off on her new world service on March 7, 1959. First, she headed to Australia and New Zealand, departing Rotterdam and sailing via Southampton through the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, Fremantle, Melbourne, Sydney, New Zealand, and then returning to Rotterdam by going through the Panama Canal. 
Because of the interesting tour locations and luxe looks of the three ships, the Royal Dutch mail ships became a very popular alternative to your typical British ocean liner. Unfortunately, the success wasn't destined to last. By the end of 1964, passenger numbers had plummeted, and it was decided that Willem Rise would be laid up in Rotterdam and put up for sale. Here's where we begin her life as the Achille Laro. In 1965, she was acquired by the Flota Laro line and renamed to the Achille Laro after the company's owner. During the conversion work to turn her into the Achille Laro in August of 1965, there was a massive onboard explosion and fire that necessitated extra work on the ship. Afterward, the ship would enter passenger service under her new name, the MS Achille Laro, in 1966, running passengers to Sydney, Australia. Achille Laro would help in evacuating the families of British troops caught up in the unrest in Aden, Yemen, during the Aden Emergency or Radran Uprising, which lasted between 1963 and 1967. It was an insurgency against British rule in the south of the Arabian Peninsula, and it marked the end of 20 years of decolonization. She made one of the last northbound transits through the Suez Canal before its closure during the Six-Day War or June War, which was a war fought between Israel and a coalition of Arab states from June 5th to the 10th in 1967. Achille Laro was once again under construction to modernize the cruise ship in early 1972, and there was another fire. The ship seems to have a problem with catching fire. In 1975, she collided with the cargo ship Yusuf, resulting in the sinking of Yusuf, and yet again in 1981, she suffered an onboard fire, causing extensive damage, and she was out of service for a while. She'd be repaired and laid up in Tenerife, the largest and most populous island of the Canary Islands, when Laro Lines unfortunately went bankrupt in 1982. The Chandras Line, a Greek-based shipping company that operated ships between Greece and Australia, took possession of the MS Achille Laro under a charter arrangement in 1985. In 1985, there was a hugely controversial and shocking event that took place on board the Achille Laro. Before we get into that, I need to set the scene just a tiny bit. You need to know what the Palestine Liberation Front was, if you don't already. It is a Palestinian political faction, and since 1997, the PLF has been designated a terrorist organization by the US and Canada since 2003, even being banned in Japan. Originally, it was funded by Iraq's Ba'ath Party, and it focuses on the removal of Israel and the promotion of Palestinian statehood. Independence is not necessarily a bad goal to have. The problem is how they go about achieving this goal, which is through violence. Note that they are an extremist organization, and not all views on Palestinian independence are the same as the violent PLF. As well as the attack on the Achille Laro, they also raided Israel's Nizanam beach near Tel Aviv in May of 1990. Please also note that the PLF, which is violent and opposes the Oslo Accords, are no longer affiliated with the Peaceful Palestinian Liberation Organization, which is now a recognized authority that represents the Palestinian people. This matter is highly political and can be very polarizing, so please be respectful of one another in the comments section. I have no opinion one way or the other, because I am not informed enough in this matter to have one. I am simply relaying the facts. Now that we know the difference between the peaceful PLO and the violent PLF, we can get into what they did aboard the Achille Laro. On October 7th of 1985, Achille Laro was off the coast of Egypt, sailing from Alexandria to Port Said in the Mediterranean Sea when four members of the PLF took control of the ship. They held the terrified passengers and crew hostage, directing the vessel to sail instead to Tartus, Syria. They demanded the release of 50 Palestinians being held in Israeli prisons. They were refused permission to dock at Tartus, Syria, and in retaliation, the hijackers killed disabled Jewish-American passenger Leon Klinghoffer, throwing his body overboard. It must have been an incredibly distressing and disturbing sight to see for the passengers. Our hearts go out to them, as well as the friends and family of Mr. Leon Klinghoffer. Because they were denied in TARDIS, the ship headed to its intended destination of Port Said in northeast Egypt. It took two days of negotiations to convince the four hijackers to abandon the liner in exchange for safe conduct. The hijackers were flown towards Tunisia on an Egyptian commercial airliner. 
which was intercepted by U.S. Navy F-14 Tomcats. The flight was directed to land in Sicily in Italy, with the United States Delta Force planning and failing to extract the hijackers in order to try them in the United States. And because of this fiasco, the Sigonella's crisis started. Sigonella was an Italian Air Force base in Sicily, which housed a U.S. Navy installation. And the United States surrounded the airplane when it landed, and they found themselves surrounded by Italian Air Force soldiers and the Carabinieri military police. Because they'd landed in Italy, the Italians insisted they had territorial jurisdiction over the hijackers since it was on their Air Force base. There ended up being a standoff between the SEAL team and the Italian military, and it was almost violent with everyone being armed. But eventually, the U.S. did turn the terrorists over to Italy, and they ended up being sentenced by the Italian courts. Unfortunately, the operation's mastermind had not physically taken part in the hijacking and was given passage to Yugoslavia and escaped justice. There were a couple films made about the hijacking, including the 1989 film The Hijacking of the Achille Lauro and the 1990 film Voyage of Terror, The Achille Lauro Affair. MS Achille Lauro would continue her career despite this major stain on her record, being reflagged in 1989 when the Lauro line was bought out by the Mediterranean Shipping Company, becoming Star Lauro. Five years later, only two months after the sinking of MV Estonia, on November 30, 1994, MS Achille Laro was sailing off the coast of Somalia on the way to South Africa, with 979 passengers and crew aboard, including musician Moss Hills from the MTS Oceanos. A fire broke out on the ship, starting apparently by a discarded cigarette, according to Italian officials at the time. Later analysis suggests that the fire started in the engine room due to cooling oil getting into the exhaust after a crankcase exploded. It burned out of control before it was discovered due to a lack of supervision, and thus doomed the ship. The crew and entertainment staff tried to put out the fire first with hoses and then with pool water and buckets, dumping gallons and gallons of water on the fire to attempt to put it out. But unfortunately, this only aggravated the flames as it was an oil fire, and all the water in the hull only hastened the ship's death, adding to the steady listing. All but two of the 979 passengers and crew were able to be evacuated, though the evacuation itself was delicate and treacherous. According to an interview with Moss Hills by Bright Suns Films here on YouTube, one of the deaths happened after a concerned passenger who desperately needed some sort of medication, later assumed to be heart medication, didn't get his medicine and passed away in a lifeboat. Moss Hills had actually wrapped his face and exposed skin in pool water soaked towels and walked into the belly of the ship to try to retrieve the medicine. However, despite his valiant effort, the ship was too engulfed in flames to reach the passenger's room and retrieve the medication, and this passenger supposedly died of a heart attack. In the morning, due to the worsening list, the evacuation began, lowering away and saving most of the passengers. However, some of the lifeboats and inflatable life rafts were being launched off the stern of the ship, lowering passengers into them with swinging, rickety ladders running down the side of the ship to the boats below due to the rising smoke and flames. One of the life rafts was either accidentally or purposefully opened on deck, accidentally hitting a passenger in the face and injuring eight others. An attempt to save them and keep them alive in the lifeboats was made, but they too sadly passed away. Everyone else was carefully lowered down into the lifeboats, and the Blue Lady, the nickname given to the Achille Laro for her blue color, burned as the passengers and crew waited for rescue. Among the eight cargo vessels and two American warships involved in the rescue were the cruiser USS Gettysburg and the frigate USS Halliburton, who took their rescued passengers and crew to Djibouti, and the eight cargo vessels took the rest of the passengers and crew to Mombasa, Kenya, Muscat, and Oman, with most heading for Mombasa, according to the New York Times. The ship sank on December 2, 1994, after Italian tugboats arrived on scene, but the fire took over and engulfed the ship, destroying it, and then it took on water and sank. The sinking was witnessed by a fire tugboat there to assess the salvageability. The wreck has yet to be located, still resting at the bottom of the ocean near Somalia. Her legacy lives on, and as we covered in the MTS Oceanos video, Moss Hills, who was yet again a hero in this story as well, now is a cruise director, a well-deserved position for him. To be in one sinking is unlucky, 
to be in two and help in the rescue of both is downright astonishing. Hats off to him for his bravery, kindness, and selflessness. As for Star Laro, the company was bought by MSC Cruises and still exists to this day. I hope this episode commemorates the Blue Lady and the sad loss of the vessel, as well as the victims of both the hijacking in 1985 and the sinking in 1994, and of course the bravery of the crew and Mr. Moss Hills for an effective evacuation of passengers and crew that day. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review, as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us. And don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the Rouse Simmons, known as the Christmas tree ship that went down on Lake Michigan in 1912. Have a great week, happy holidays, and we'll see you next time.